Creekside Online. Our mission is to reach the world with Jesus one person at a time with Christ, community, and compassion. We are so glad that you are joining us today. If it is your very first time, please take a moment to click the link below and fill out an online connect card. We would love for you to stay connected throughout the week and everywhere you go. And the best way to do that is through our church app. There you can watch additional messages and find resources to help you grow in your relationship with Christ. It's free and you can download it wherever you download your apps. For us, church is so much more than just a weekend experience. And we want you to know that there's a place here for you at Creekside. No matter where you're watching today, let's get ready for what God has in store for us. So again, just to reiterate, our faith promises our gifts above and beyond our tithe, our regular giving to our general fund. Uh, we don't fund uh, missions out of our regular offerings. Missions are funded through what you give above and beyond your regular giving. So please, that's why we say pray about it. It's a faith muscle that you can exercise, and I know you will if you really dial into the sermon today. If you're really connected to Jesus today, you really get how the power of God works. That's what we've been talking about from the book of Acts. We've had a 15.4 sermon from Acts 15.4, gave you a report of what happened. We also then last week talked about Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Um, are you all tracking with me like in your Bibles or in your smarter than you phones? I hope that you kind of pull those out. Sometimes pull the scriptures out. I, I throw these things out. You can track with me. You at home, please be checking up to see if what I say is true. But Acts 1.8, you know, Jesus had ascended into heaven. He died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. He appeared to more than 500 witnesses during a period of 40 days. And then in Acts chapter 1, it says he's ascending into heaven. These disciples had never seen anything like that before. And their mouths are just like, you know, wide open, their jaws hitting the ground. The angels are like, hey, <laughs> you know, you can keep looking in the sky. He's going to come back sometime. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. But I got a job for you to do until he does. The same job that he gives to us today. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, look, you're going to be my witnesses. A witness just means that you go and you, you just tell others, you share others. If you have the opportunity about who Jesus is is what he means to you if you witnessed a crime you just share what you saw what you share what you see what you know about Jesus the meaning the purpose we're going to be talking about all these things so you'll know what to share but that's Acts 1 8 we talked about that power that's dunamin in the original language of the Greek which means you know it's where we get our word dynamite it's this power that just wells within us that moves us forward and so Acts 1 8 they're they're told to to go to Jerusalem to pray to get ready for this power that's going to come upon them and so they pray for the nine days and then on the tenth day in Acts chapter 2 verse 1 they're all together Together. They're in like probably the outer temple courts. The Bible says they're all in one accord. Whoever knew that Honda could make such a good vehicle all the way back then too and get everybody together in one accord? <laughs> Come on, you guys. Give me some slack. I don't know. I hope it just gets better from there, okay? Just stay tuned. Uh, <clears throat> they're all together in one accord. Man, Acts chapter 1 and 2, they're just, man, they're, they're fired up. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, they hear this rushing mighty wind. And it's just this, it, the, the original Aramaic language says it's kind of this groaning, this inner groaning. And so the people, they don't feel wind. If they're like 50 yards away, 200 yards away, they don't feel the wind. But they hear this thing going on. They go, what's going on in this one area of the temple courts? And so they start running. They just dash to hear what's going on. And, of course, Jerusalem's full of people from all different lands because it's Pentecost, a Jewish celebration of the Feast of the Tabernacles. And they want to know, what's this about? It seems very supernatural to them, and it is. All of a sudden, this pillar of fire in the Aramaic, it just kind of gives you this sense that it's these woven pillars of fire more than your fireplace they're just intertwining but they never go away and and this pillar kind of reminds you of Moses right Moses in the desert and the pillar of fire by night that he led the Israelites by that was the time when God was kind of distanced from the people he was close man no other nation experienced God the way they did but God in this moment in Acts chapter 2 was saying I'm getting closer than the people in Exodus experienced me 
In fact, that's his whole message in the Bible. You know, Genesis chapter 1, he was so close. He walked with us individually in the coal of the evening, and he fellowshiped with Adam and Eve, and then our sin separated us from God. And all through the Bible, you see this amazing plan God has to get close to us again. And he does it there with the Israelites by day, and he does it with Abraham. He does it through the Bible with Noah and all these people in a, in a, in a temple, in a holy of holy place uh, uh, that was set up from a tabernacle, all basically symbolic of what heaven's going to be like ultimately someday. But really, God was saying, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. I'm going to get even closer. I'm going to walk among you. <laughs> and he did. He became human. He walked among and he taught in ways that people had never heard before. And they said, how did he get this knowledge without any learning? Read it for yourself. You'll get the same impression. How did he do these miracles? And all these witnesses saw these miracles, amazing things. Storms suddenly get calm. How did he do that? They knew that he was the son of God to be able to do that. And so he proved himself through all these various things that happened. And Jesus got so close, but he says, that's not as close as I want to get. I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. I'm going to pour forth my Holy Spirit that will be in you, a down payment, guaranteeing what's to come, so that someday you'll be face-to-face with me again. You'll be together with me again. And that's what this Acts chapter 2 is all about. It's part of that story. Jesus has come here in this, these flames of fire and the flames of fire suddenly separate because God's saying, I'm no longer this distant God. I'm pouring myself out. And the apostles got that flame on their heads. They began to speak languages they hadn't learned before. Either that or they were speaking their same language and the people were hearing them in their own native tongue and language. And what were they saying? Jesus He died. He rose again. He's coming back. In fact, the people were just so freaked out by it. They're like, whoa. Some of the people that were hearing other people, and they didn't know what they were talking about. They're like, these people, they've had too much. They're inebriated. And Peter gets up, and he says, "Uh uh-uh. It's nine in the morning. Are you kidding me? No, this is God fulfilling prophecy. And he goes back to Joel, and he preaches all about Jesus. You know, there's 300 prophecies. You ought to check them out. Archaeology's validated those prophecies written hundreds of years before Jesus. And Peter preaches this amazing sermon proving that Jesus indeed had risen from the dead and all the promises God predicting, how he validated those through the miracles. They knew it. They knew it very well. And he said in verse 32, chapter 2, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. He's being faithful to be a witness. Exalted to the right hand of God... He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. He's given us what he's promised, his Holy Spirit. He told his disciples he was going to give it. He's promised it. He's done it. He's poured it out. Friends, we still believe he does that today. He wants to give you his Holy Spirit, but you've got to seek it. You've got to be all in just as the disciples were. We believed it early on when we started this church 20 years ago. We believed that what Jesus said in John 7, 37 and 38 would be true for us as a church. And so we put a big fountain in the lobby. It's now the student center, but that was our first church building. We put this big fountain. There, there it is. That's in my office right now. It said, believe, John 7, 37, 38. And the story there is of Jesus stepping forth in this very traditional setting. Boy, he would have made a scene. But he wasn't embarrassed. He stepped out and he goes, if anybody would believe in me, he shouted. That's what the scripture says. If anybody would believe in me, springs of living water will flood from within their soul. He's using terminology that only God was used of God in the Old Testament. That springs of his living water would come within a person who believes in him. What was Jesus doing? He's claiming to be God. And then it even says in the text what he meant by that. By that, he meant his Holy Spirit, who those who believed in him would later receive. Friends, that's you and me. He wants to pour his Spirit into our lives. He wants to give us gifts to share with others. It's a fellowship that we want to talk about today. How does he do it? 
First of all, recognizing he's the foundation of the church. It's all about Jesus, not about anything else. Jesus is it. <laughs> you got Jesus, man. You've got the start of an overflow of a flooding within your soul. He's more than ready and willing to pour forth his spirit. But the Bible tells us, it commands us to be praying to be filled with his spirit on a daily basis. Going on to verse 35, Psalm 110, 1 is quoted there because, again, that's another prophecy he's quoting. And then he gets to verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, Lord and Messiah. You were waiting for God's anointed one to come and save Israel. Guess what? You put him to death. You killed him. It'd be like Zelensky calling on Navy SEALs and calling on the UN, calling to help, and, and the Navy SEALs arrive, everybody arrives, and then somebody says, no, what? you sent the missile the wrong direction. You just killed the, the rescue. By the way, don't be too hard on the Jews at that time. You know why? We killed them too. Every single one of us, the Bible says, our sins put him on that tree. The Bible says while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Each and every one of us struggled deeply with sin. No matter how long you've been a Christian, it's still hanging in there trying to raise from the dead in you again that fleshly impulse. But with the Holy Spirit, with God, we have power to overcome anything the evil one could throw at us. Verse 37, then the people heard this. They were cut to the heart. The word in the Aramaic is just this feeling of, be, of being crushed. Have you ever hurt your child so much? It's you just, it crushes you that you would hurt them that deeply. This is more than that. They are crushed in the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what must we do? What shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Repent means to change your mind about how you're living. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's very simple. You believe in Jesus, now repent, say, I'm going to change my mind and follow you, Jesus, the way you want me to. I'm going to be baptized. And then you receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise, it says in verse 39, is for you and your children, for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. He's calling today. Do you hear him? Do you hear him? I pray that you hear him and that, and that this is a ringing in your ear of God's love for you, even though you've sinned and even though you put him on a cross. Because he came on purpose to die for you and to go to the grave and then be raised again and then to ascend to heaven so we'd have a hope he's coming back again. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. I pray that rings in your ears. I pray that it reverberates in your heart. I pray it echoes in your soul today verse 40 with many other words he warned them he pleaded with them like i'm pleading today save yourselves from this corrupt generation if this two last years hasn't proved to you how corrupt the generation is that we're in today he's pleading with you save yourself this place is temporary there's an eternal home friends all i'm doing is being an advisor this morning i'm just opening the scriptures advising you we don't judge here we don't judge we don't say where a person is jesus is the only one who, who saves after the resurrection this is the only message we know that he's given to us so we're not judges to tell you where you are with the lord and we're not going to be attorneys to defend our positions all we're going to do is advise you we're going to open the scriptures we want you to just sit beside us look at the scriptures and see how god is calling you personally individually C.S. Lewis once said, one thing Christianity can never be is moderately important. In other words, there's no such thing as a Sunday-only Christian. There's no such thing as a casual Christian. There's no such thing as a part-time Christian. You can never be moderately important. You know, the early church said, what must we do to be saved? And then they continued on in that pattern, even under persecution. I mean, they stayed hard at it. They were spiritual warriors, like what you're seeing in Ukraine, except that's a temporary warrior for a temporary land. They stayed spiritual war warriors for an eternal land. So what must we do to be saved? We're going to listen to the calling of the Lord every day. You know, in the United States of America, it's been said, instead of what must I do, it's what can I do 
to just get by? Or what can I do to still be saved? It was never that question. (laughs) Let me put it this way. Instead of that I'm a husband or I'm a leader or I'm a golfer, hunter, and fisherman, and I'm a father, when you're a Christian, it's more like I'm a Christ-surrendered husband. And so I, I behave under Christ's leadership. I'm a Christ-surrendered father. And so I do my best not to exasperate my children. I'm a Christ-surrendered husband and leader in the community. So I do my best under his leadership. I'm a Christ-surrendered golfer except when it's a par three and I've three putted that's I'm a hot mess at that point but anyhow I and you hopefully as Christ followers try to live your life fully surrendered to the Lord what we're talking about here is when you get to this point our vision for your life individually is that Jesus would be an overflow in your life how does he overflow how does this spirit overflow in your life three ways Christ, community, he's your Messiah, he's your anointed one. There's a deep anointing, a purpose, a meaning, a security. He's Christ, he's community, and he becomes compassion in you and through you. He overflows in those three ways. What are those three ways? What are those benefits to his people? As Christ and Lord, all his promises are true to us. If Jesus is a prince, we're princes and princesses too. He calls us brothers and sisters. We're secure in him. Secondly, if we're in his community, we have his community with us, then we are satisfied in the fellowship. It's just deep and meaningful to us. Nothing in this world satisfies other than relationships with God's people and him. It's amazing how that works. I've been out on yachts with different people, and I've been like, that's nice. But this doesn't, still didn't beat me sharing deeply in my small group with other people. People that I trust. That's so fleeting. How about compassion? When you have his compassion, man, you just keep loving and giving. Even with your enemies, you, you care about them deeply. You could see their point of view. If they don't have Christ, well, of course they're going to act that way. And so you have compassion. You have love. Because there's this purpose. There's this significance that wells up deep within your heart that comes only from the Father. You know you serve an audience of one. All that matters is what God thinks of you now. Not fame, not fortune. Less than a year ago, I was in a stadium that was packed out, man. 80,000 fans, Allegiant Stadium, Las Vegas, and my son's out there playing, and he led the team to, I think it was like 20 to 7 victory over the LA Rams, man. He beat the Super Bowl champions. <laughs> Woo! I know you're going, you're going, wait, check, that was preseason. Yeah. I, I got you. I understand that. Doesn't mean I still wasn't proud of that boy in front of 80,000 fans. Are you kidding? The kind of pressure the first time in that stadium, everybody was there. Can I just tell you something? That's fleeting. That didn't satisfy. That didn't give me security. That didn't give me significance, nor him, because he sold out. You see, he understands he serves an audience of one. Can I just tell you, this is what matters most. The overflow of the Holy Spirit in your life. And he, if you get this overflow, he will give you more security, more satisfaction, more significance than this world can provide. But you got to believe it. you got to be all in. you got to be surrendered. And that's what this message is about today. And so, what we do is we make Jesus the main thing, and we seek his spirit filling within, and we know that it's our job just to shine the light on Jesus, because that's what the Holy Spirit came to do, to convict us of sins and to point people to Jesus. Point them to the cross, so that we get to heaven and bring as many with us as possible. 
So he does. You know, we have smart lighting in here, and we were blessed because the people provided it for free. It's an amazing thing. I don't know if you know what smart lighting is. Basically, it has these touch capabilities where they can point the lights wherever they want, different colors. Uh, lights turn on and off. In other words, they control your mind. Right? <laughs> I know the conspiracy theories are starting already in our church today. What's he doing with the lights? But seriously, lights can be a powerful tool, right, to focus our intention in important ways. Right? Well, the truth is, every church spotlights something, and they don't even realize it. Do you know that? Some churches put the spotlight on buildings. It's about the greatest building. But you know, in the original language, church, ecclesia, where we get the word church, didn't even mean a building. It just meant set apart people for him. Never meant a building. But some churches spotlight buildings, and that's great. We have a wonderful building. We're thankful to God out of the overflow. He's provided this building. You know, we had architects come and our, looked at our first building, and they looked at our master plan for putting the The plan has always been from, like, the first year to put the building back here where we're sitting right now. And they're like, what were you doing? What were you thinking? You should have put it out on the road where there's advertisement. We're like, no, our people are the advertisement. People sold out on fire for the Holy Spirit. They're going to be the ones that go and flood into the community and share the light and the love of Jesus as salt and light. No, the church isn't a building. The church is people. They're great tools for ministry, but the church has always been about people. Rick Warren says in his Purpose Driven Church, the church isn't about the preacher either. The church doesn't shine the light on the preacher, not supposed to, anyhow. You know, these are the churches that have a well-known pastor whose name is so big that he's got a great jaw. I mean, he has charisma. He's a rock star. If he has a juicy testimony, that's even better to have a pastor like that, right? But the church is not about the preacher. It's not about me. Some churches shine the spotlight on political action. The church... Uh, this church becomes known more about what it's against than what it's for, perhaps. Or they just want to make sure you're voting for the right people. And in this land, we're so grateful we should be able to vote. I'm so grateful we're not in a dictatorship. But friends, do you know that you can't change people through government? Do you understand that we can't legislate morality? There's only one thing that will change people and bring morality, and that is Jesus Christ and his government living deep in our souls individually. And until we give people Jesus, the world won't change. That's why the church is the hope of the world. And we don't spotlight social action either. Yes, some of our missions ministries do social action, but we know this for a fact. Jesus said, a cup of cold water must be given in my name for it to be true worship and true witness. So when we do good for others, we're always to attach the name of Jesus with it. We shine the spotlight on faith in Jesus. We shine it on this overflow of faith and deep fellowship with the Spirit that we have because we know if people really get it, if they really believe in Jesus like he said when he stepped forward in that crowd, that there's going to be this security and satisfaction and significance that come in them. There will be Christ, community, and compassion that come through them. In this groundbreaking sermon in Acts 2.40, it really answers the question, how in the world... Did Jerusalem change as rapidly as it did in the first century to be Jews and Christians? You know, in 20 years, they said half of Jerusalem was converted. How in the world does a city that had remained loyal to one religion over a thousand years suddenly become Christian and Jewish? I'll tell you how. Jesus rose from the dead. That's how. And he lived deep in their hearts. They couldn't hold it back. More than 500 had seen him risen from the dead. And so they shared it. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. What a way to start the church, huh? How many did you have yesterday? Zero. How many did you have today? 3,000. They devoted themselves. This is what the early church did, and this is what the church has been doing ever since. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
This is an Acts 2.42 church. We want to always be an Acts 2.42 church. What does that mean? We will always have the breaking of bread, which is communion. We will always focus in on prayer. Always focus on the apostles' doctrine. Preaching will always be a priority here. And fellowship is always a priority. What's fellowship? Fellowship is a deep sharing together, using of your gifts. You're jointly contributing your gifts together. Why? Because we have deep fellowship with Jesus. And when you have deep fellowship with Jesus, you can't help but share that with other people. And verse 43 says, everyone was filled with awe because of this deep relating, contributing jointly their gifts together. They're filled with awe. Many wonders and signs were performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone that had need. Now, this was not communism. Communism and socialism is conscripted giving of what you have so as to benefit the elite. No, this was motivation from deep within. They had an overflow of Jesus in their heart. They couldn't help but give their possessions because they knew they were living for another land. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord was adding to the number daily those who were being saved. What does all this mean again? That fellowship with Jesus is a fantastic thing. You will be amazing. You'll be amazed at the grace and the generosity that flows through your life. There'll be times you think, how am I doing this? How am I showing grace to my enemies? Well, it's because Jesus is welled up within your hearts. Jesus and fellowship with him compels us to share his goodness with others. Heard the story about a farmer, you know, who called the office. He was a pig farmer. He called the office to talk to the preacher. And he told the uh, receptionist that picked up the phone, hey, uh, I want to see the head hawk at the trough. The receptionist said, well, sir, if you're talking about our our wonderful minister, we, we really love him and care about him. And I just don't think it's appropriate to call him head hog at the trough. I mean, you could, you could call him, you know, minister like we call him or pastor. And he said, oh, well, I just sold about 10 pigs. And I was thinking about giving 30,000 to the church. She said, just a second. The big pig just walked in. What I'm about to share is not because we're desperate, okay, folks? What I, what I want to share is that this is a joyous thing. That's why we've always had a joyous church here. Because all these building campaigns, all the sacrifices, it just makes the rejoicing abound more and more. How do you have this overflow? Well, as an individual, you've got to make Jesus Lord of your life. Is he Lord? I heard the story about a mom who was making pancakes for her two sons. Five-year-old Kevin and three-year-old Ryan were arguing over who would get the first pancake. Imagine that. So mom decided to teach him a lesson about unselfishness. And she said, you know, boys, if Jesus were sitting here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. I'm waiting. Five-year-old Kevin leaned over to three-year-old Ryan, and he said, Okay, Ryan, you can be Jesus. <laughs> Following Jesus sounds great until you realize we're supposed to surrender our, Lord, our wills to him, right? It sounds great. We love the part about Savior, but you know in the book of Acts, Savior only appears three times. You know in the book, the whole New Testament, Savior only appears 19 times. Just the word Savior. I counted it myself again last night. But do you know the word Lord is over 700 times? And do you know whenever Lord and Savior are in the same sentence, Lord is always first? Because Lord is what God wants. A surrendered will to him for overflow. We wonder why the Lord's not overflowing in our life. We don't feel this power that I've been talking about. Well, have you really made him Lord? That's the question. And when he is Lord, it's just natural then to do the second thing, to do diligence to point people towards Jesus. Man, I'll tell you, I've met some amazing students up at UNF because one of our missions supports them, the Navigators Ministry, and I was part of that. Man, the joy that's coming from those college kids who have nothing, but they long to give to me. He was just a visitor there. That's what happens when you fellowship deeply with Jesus. Man, we, we point people 
to Jesus out of the blessing that we feel from God. We want to bless because we feel so blessed. That's why we call our, our outreach to the community, Bless Every Home. I want to put that up on the screen again. I hope you'll pick, point, pull out your Smarter Than You uh, phones and point it to that and get that QR code and then learn about that. Because it's amazing how God begins flowing through you as we begin praying for the neighbors around you. Two ministers that were mentors to me, John and Bob Russell, grew up in my same hometown. So I always looked up to them, but I'll never forget the story they told. It was about their dad, Chap, who was an elder, amazing man, but we never knew this humble zipper factory worker, how much he meant to the kingdom until later. One day he's walking with his boy to go get some tennis shoes downtown Connieville, which is still 800 people to this day. The banker saw him. They came out and said, your church is in trouble. He said, what? Your church is in trouble. He said, sorry, son, we're not going to be able to buy those sneakers today. And he gave the banker some money to keep the accounts open, went home, and found out it was really deeper than he ever thought. And so he remortgaged his house to help the church that was in struggle, trouble. And he got a second job in a sawmill to pay that second mortgage off. Is it any wonder that his boys seeing that have influenced more than 30,000 people? Their churches grew to 30,000 people in just a short 40 years. Is it any wonder that they mentor preachers to this day, having seen such an example of overflow in their father, who is just a common zipper factory worker? People want their kids to turn out right. It starts, it starts by the overflow in your life. Kids are sponges. Acts 20, 35, and everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Those are the words of Jesus. Those are the mantra of the early church in Acts. In Matthew 6, 21, he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus himself, two-thirds of his parables were about money. And there's 2,350 passages in the Bible dealing with money. I only preach about three times a year. You're getting the short end of the stick. Jesus talked about it more than anything else. In Luke 16, 15, no servant, 13, rather, no servant can serve two masters, either hate the one and love the other, be devoted to one or despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Do you know how they catch monkeys in Africa? They put a banana in a little jar. The monkey reaches in. He grabs the banana and he won't let go. He's trapped. He could just release it and he would be free. Same thing's true with us and what we think we possess on this earth. As long as we hold on it so tightly, it has us and we're not truly free. You want to be really liberated? And think about giving. Americans have come down to giving about 3% of their income versus 10% 100 years ago. Sean O'Neill studied that, and he said, as a result, our outreach has been diminished at least 50%. Talk show host Dave Ramsey once spoke about how different America would be if the Christians just tithed. He said there would be no more welfare in North America, and in 90 days, there would be no existing church or hospital debts. In the next 90 days, the entire world would be evangelized. There would be prayer back in schools. Why? Because Christians would own every school if just every Christian tithed. Friends, almost every program, every plan for communicating the gospel costs money. How many times have I sat in meetings and we said, we want to do this for the kingdom, but we can't do it. We're worried about how much it's going to cost. If you haven't given to God out of love, and not out of obligation. Could I just encourage you to pray about that? Pray about the Lordship of Jesus in your life. Maybe today, maybe you don't have to dive in. I'll tell you, the water's fine if you do, but you don't have to dive in. Maybe you're just one of those people that wade into the pool of giving. Just give it a chance. Say, God, I'm going to believe that you bless me, so I'm going to choose to bless others. And maybe it's just a $30 gift a week for a little while or But try it. I challenge you. Watch God flow through you. Bible again. Tara said, give and it'll be given to you. She's just quoting Jesus in Luke 6, 36. A good measure we press down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 
I love Jesus. In Luke 16, one of my favorite passages, it says, use worldly wealth to make friends for eternity. And that's what we're talking about today, friends. As we come and think about a time of communing with Jesus, seeking a deeper fellowship with him, we're going to be taking communion in a minute. Ask him to give you a better perspective on what he's blessed you with. He gives us 100%. It's all his. Every breath that you have is his. Every talent that you have is his. We're not to compare with others. We're just to be faithful with the little that we have, the parable of the talent says. All I can say to you as we go to him in communion is with, for me personally, without Jesus, I don't stand a chance before the throne someday. I know I've never been a perfect giver. I want to be a better giver, and I believe I can be out of the overflow of him in my life. Without Jesus, I don't stand a chance. Unless he's in me, beside me, I don't stand a chance at the throne of eternity. Steve Winger from Lubbock, Texas, writes about his last college test. It's a final in logic. And the professor said, everybody can take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and you can write as small as you want, but you can use that as your sheet to help you get through the test. One student was wise enough to bring in an empty sheet of paper and he put it down on the floor beside him and he had an advanced logic student stand beside him on the paper and whisper the answers into his ear. He's the only one that aced the test. Friends, without Jesus, we will fail the ultimate exam. If you don't have him beside you and in you and flowing through you, it doesn't matter what you say when the Lord asks you, why should I let you in? It doesn't matter how many good deeds you have done. The question will be, have you had the overflow of my Holy Spirit in you? Otherwise, it'll be, depart from me. I never knew you. Did you have fellowship with me? Because if you had a deep fellowship like Acts 2.42, it'll be undeniable, our relationship. So as we take communion, if you haven't gotten, received the elements yet, please raise your hands and somebody will deliver those to you. Keep them up high. I'm going to go ahead and lead us in prayer. Let's evaluate our relationship with the Lord. Father, we come before you right now. We thank you for what you've given to us. Most importantly, Lord, you gave us your son. You gave us all that you had for us, your very heart and soul and mind. And you've asked us in return to trust you back, to be witnesses, to be a part of this grace, to overflow with your goodness so that more and more people will come into your kingdom. And so, Father, I pray that you speak to us in this hour and how we might love you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We hope the message you just listened to had an impact on you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week online at creeksidechristian.com and on Facebook and Instagram at at Creekside Christian Church. We believe God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before. We love you, and we'll see you next time.